time. So, um, um, although it sounds uh, um, a bit unfair, it's for the purpose of allowing everyone to have an equal opportunity. We request the questions to be brief and definitely to the topic. If they're not to the topic, then uh, we can use, um, it's probably uh, uh, um, would be apt that you could ask them to um, ourselves um, after the, the, the event is finished. Not that we wouldn't want to answer your questions, but um, the questions um, should ideally be related to what the speaker has spoken about. Um, that's, yeah. Um, yeah, no, no problem. Okay, you can fire away. Can somebody? Yeah, the volume. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. My question in particular, and I hope I have sufficient time for a brief comment is concerning the speaker which says that Jesus only came for his nation and he quoted a scripture there where he says came, he came unto his own and his own received him not but Jesus himself said to his disciples he said go ye into all the world and preach the gospel unto every nation and kindred and tongue and people beginning at Jerusalem teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you and uh, as well I like to say it was mentioned there that Jesus never claimed divinity but Thomas spoke to Jesus and Thomas said after Jesus told Thomas you can put your hand in my side Je Thomas said my Lord and my God and again in Luke chapter 24 day about the disciples came after Jesus blessed the disciples the disciples worship him and the Bible said that they came away they came back rejoicing after they had worshiped him and another instance after the man was let down to the roof and was healed Jesus told him thy sins be forgiven thee Thanks. so so on these three points, I am saying, yeah. Jesus is God, because only God can receive worship. Only God can forgive sins. And I'll just limit my point there. That's and also, he created. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, would the speaker like to reply? The brother asked two questions. His first part of the question was that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, did not only come for the Jews, he told his disciples to go out also preach to the world. What the brother is quoting is the last few verses of Gospel of Matthew, which, according to scholars of Christianity, are not the words of Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself. If you pick up a Bible, a red letter Bible, it contains the words of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him in red. These words, though they're mentioned in red, the scholar says these are not the words of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. The words of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him in red ink, is Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 10, verse number 5 and 6, which told to the apostles that go ye not into the way of the Gentiles, the way of the non-Jews. Enter ye not into the city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost ship of the house of Israel. Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, said, it's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 15, verse number 24, he said that I have not been sent but to the lost ship of the house of Israel. So the words of Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, carries more weight than anybody else's word. Now coming to your second question. You gave several quotations saying that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he is almighty God because people worshipped him, you are saying. But that is what other people did. If someone worships me, do I become God? If someone worships me, do I become God? If some lunatic comes and tells me, oh Zakir, you are quoting Quran so well, you are God. Do I become God? That's what Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, we were said God. I quoted my talk in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 19, verse number 16 to 17. One person calls him good. Good master, what good things shall I do so that I should get eternal life? He says, why thou callest me good? Leave aside God. He doesn't know how to call good also. God has got one O. Good has got two O's. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, why thou callest me good? There is only one good and that is the Father in heaven. That's Almighty God. Regarding the quotation you gave me, you told that Thomas, 
said I want to check the nail print. You didn't give the reference. The reference you're talking about is Gospel of John, chapter number 20, verse number 28, where Thomas says, Oh, oh God, my Lord, my God. You didn't give the statement. I'm giving you the statement because I'm used to speaking with Christians. The statement is, my Lord, my God. Because Thomas said, my Lord, my God, therefore Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is God, according to many of the Christian missionaries. To know the context, you have to read a few verses before. And if you read Gospel of John, chapter number 20, verse number 24 to 29, it says that when the people came to know that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, had not given up the ghost, he had not died, people could not believe. When all the disciples were discussing, Thomas said, I will not believe it until I see the nail print in, with my own eyes in the hands of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Until I put my finger into his hand, until I thrust my hand into his side. So when Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, comes, he says, Oh Thomas, see the nail print, put thy finger into my hand and put thy arm into my side. And then, Jesus, and then Thomas, peace be upon him, says that, My Lord, my God. This is an exclamation. For example, you know, if I'm discussing for a long time and if I'm talking to a friend and he says, My God, it is 4.30. Doesn't mean I'm calling him God. It's just exclamation. It was yes, sir. If, if, that's what I'm telling you. <laughs> Will my friend tell me, Oh, don't call me God. He understands it's an exclamation. If, if I'm talking to my friend, and he says, oh, it's late, my God, it is five o'clock, I have to go. So he says, oh, don't call me God. <laughs> I have the sense, I'm not a lunatic to tell him, don't call me God. I know he's not calling me God. It's an exclamation. My God, it is so late. So if you read the context, you come to know there is not a single unequivocal statement. And furthermore, in my talk, what I said, Jesus Christ himself did not say. All the three quotation you gave was of somebody else telling his God. What I told in my talk, I challenge any Christian, I challenge any Christian to point out a single unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says that I am God or where he says worship me. If other people say that does not make him God. Anyhow, I've given you the answer even for the three quotations that you gave. Hope that answers the question. Brother. Can I just, um, <clears throat> yeah, can I just request uh, most of the brothers and um, anyone in the audience that we shouldn't really laugh aloud while the speaker is um, answering the question because it's not befitting the nature of such an, a, a talk. Also, if um, speakers are allowed to come and uh, reply, um, um, they have another opportunity provided the mic is available, but we'd request them not to speak during um, the time that the speaker is speaking just to give justice to his answer. You're, you're free now if you want to, seeing that the mic is free to come and use it again. We'd give preference to people who don't share the Islamic faith, seeing that this um, event is ideally so that we can remove misconceptions about Islam and um, educate people about Islam. But if there's no one else, then um, Muslims are allowed. Oh, sorry, other, sorry, the sisters, sorry. Um, yeah, this, could the sister ask the question? Um, the question isn't actually relevant, so we'll leave it till afterwards. Okay. Uh, yeah, you can come again. Um, is that, does the gentleman at the back pronounce? Okay, go on, go ahead. What I'm really, um, as the, the brother mentioned there that Jesus uh, did not, did not rebuke Thomas and when, when he was worshipped that anybody um, could receive worship as well. But if you study the scriptures carefully, you will see in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10, when John was in vision there, and John fell down to worship an angel, and the angel stopped him and said, See that thou doest it not, for I am of thy fellow servant, thy brethren. Worship God, for him only shalt shall thou worship, or so on, or worship God. Now I'm saying here that Jesus Christ was perfect in all his ways. He said there was no sin found in him. He said of the Jews, which of you convicted me of sin? And certainly in his life, in his life, he never did anything that was wrong. 
and the very fact that the Bible records that the disciples worship him. Now if they had done something wrong, certainly Jesus would have withheld himself, certainly he would have rebuked them. I can remember that after Jesus rose from the grave that the woman came at the tomb and 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 fell down to can, worship him, to hold him. Can the speaker just limit it? Yes, I'm not limited here. So what I'm saying there really is that if worship was not due to Jesus, he certainly would have refused it. And secondly, if he was not God, as Thomas, Thomas said, then certainly he would have rebuked such a statement. Thanks a lot for your Thank you. Okay. The brother again has given the same statement that people worship Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, and he didn't rebuke them. That means that he accepted it. Brother, all these statements you have mentioned, all these quotations are in black. Black means not the words of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. So if it's not the word of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, how can Jesus Christ stop them? The only way Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, can stop them is the words are in red. And the quotation which I gave you in my talk are the words in red, said by Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself. Not all the things that you have said is a third party narration. For example, Revelation. You know Revelation? Revelation is a dream seen by St. John. In the dream you can do anything. In the dream anyone can become God. So if you see in a dream someone has become God, that doesn't mean that person becomes God. What I told you, but the condition that I give you, all of them, Alhamdulillah, all of them are in red letter. It means the words of Jesus Christ. When I say Jesus Christ said, my father is greater than I, it's in red. My father is greater than all, it's in red. And even the one of Matthew, chapter number 19, verse number 16 to 17, when a person approaches Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, and tells him that, what good things shall I do so that I shall enter eternal life? This is the words in red. Then Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, replies, why thou callest me good? Because he himself is speaking. All the other quotations you gave are in black ink. Black ink means somebody else is telling. Red ink, according to the Christian scholars, if it is a red letter Bible, it is the word of Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself. And himself says, why thou callest me good? There is no good except one that's Father in heaven. So do you mean to say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is contradicting? Sometimes he's saying he's God, sometimes he's saying he's not God. He's not, he's saying I'm not good also, leave us at God. Furthermore, even when he was asked that if you want to enter eternal life, he said, keep the commandments. He didn't say worship me. And furthermore, regarding the statement you said that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, did not commit any sin, I agree with you, brother. We as Muslims, we believe that all the prophets of God, they were sinless, they were masoom. So we very well agree that not only Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was sinless, even Moses, peace be upon him, was sinless, and even Muhammad, peace be upon him, was sinless. And we agree with you in this point that they were sinless. But because they were sinless, that does not make them God. That because they were prophets of God. They got the message of Almighty God to deliver it to the human beings. Hope that answers the question. Could we have a question from the sister's side, please? Well, assalamu alaikum. Um, a friend of mine who is born Catholic has been struggling to accept Islam for eight years and finally came to a conclusion that, here's what he said to me, quote, I could no longer reject Lord Jesus because if I accept Islam, Lord Jesus would not be the Son of God, unquote. How could I help him? Thank you. Thanks a lot. The sister has a question. That one of her friends studied Islam for eight years and finally came to the conclusion that if I accept Islam, I'll reject Lord Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. And I cannot reject Lord Jesus, peace be upon him, because he is the Son of God. Regarding the first part of his statement, that he'll have to reject Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. If he rejects Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he cannot be a Muslim. To be a Muslim, one of the criteria is he has to accept Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, as one of the mightiest messengers of Almighty God. If he rejects Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he cannot be a Muslim. So first part of his problem is solved. As I mentioned in my talk, that Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith to believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Any other religion he accepts, he'll have to reject Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, except Islam. Now coming to the second part of the question, that how can... He cannot reject that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is not son of God. As far as the term the son of God is concerned, God has got son by the times in the Bible. If you read the Bible, the Bible says, Adam was son of God. 
David was son of God. Ephraim was son of God. Israel was son of God. It's mentioned in the Bible in the book of Romans that as many are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Means whosoever is a righteous person is the son of God. If you are righteous, you are son of God. If I am righteous, I am son of God. So most verily we do agree that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, most verily was the son of God. We have no objection. But there are many Christians who say that no, 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 no. He is not a normal son. He is the begotten son of God. And they quote, Gospel of John, chapter number 3, verse number 16, they say, that for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believeth in him shall not die, but have everlasting life. This is the only quotation they can give to prove that son of God, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was different. He was unique. Gospel of John, chapter number 3, verse number 16. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believeth in him shall not die, but have everlasting life. What is the meaning of the word begotten? And if you ask any Christian, what is the meaning of the word begotten? It will be difficult to answer. Begotten means sired by God. It's the function of lower animals of sex. And if you read the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, the RSV, revised by Thaidu Christian scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 different copy denominations, these Thaidu Christian scholars, they say that this word begotten in Gospel of John, chapter number 3, verse number 16, is an interpolation, is a concoction, is a fabrication. And they threw it out of the Bible. So if you read the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, Revised by Thaidu scholars of the highest eminence, Christian scholars, they say this word begotten is an interpolation. So the only verse with which the Christian missionaries can cling the deal, the Christian scholars have removed it. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is just the Son of God. And if, as the Bible says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God, we verily agree that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, most verily is the Son of God. But he is not the begotten son of God. As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse 1 to 4, Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Say he is Allah one and only. Allah hu samad. Allah the absolute and eternal. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. Wa lam yakul lahu kufana. There is nothing like him. The moment someone begets, or someone gets begotten, he is not almighty God. Hope that answers the question. Can I have a question from the brother's side, please? Salaam. Well, first, I have the opportunity to thank you for a very informative talk, mashallah. Uh, my question is that Musa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came with one mission. How would a follower of that one mission respond to scriptures of, uh, for example, Hinduism and Sikhism? Could you repeat the last part? How would a follower of that mission brought by the uh, prophets, peace and blessings be upon them, respond to the scriptures of Hinduism and Sikhism? <coughs> The brother posed the question that how will the followers of Moses, Jesus and Muhammad, peace be upon them, follow? Or how will they respond, respond to the scriptures of the Hindus and Sikhs, and the Sikhs, etc.? As far as the scriptures are concerned, of the other religion, Hinduism, etc., as I mentioned, that even if you go to these scriptures of the Hindus, they too talk about the same common mission. They too talk about the same common mission, where people may ask me, that does it mean that Ram is God, or is he a messenger of God, sorry, or is Krishna a messenger of God? See, as the Quran says that there were 124,000 messengers sent on the face of the earth, by name only 25 are mentioned, I cannot say that Ram or Krishna is surely the messenger of God. Because the name is not mentioned in any Quranic verse, neither in any Sahih Hadith. What I can say, maybe they are, maybe they are not. But even if they are, the messengers of God, they were meant for those people and for that time. Today, you have to follow the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. Coming to the scriptures, the Vedas, the Bhagavad Gita, similarly, there has been a revelation sent in every age. By name, only four are mentioned in the Quran. Veda, a question may be asked, can we consider it to be the word of God? I say, I don't know. We cannot say for sure it's the word of God. Maybe it is, maybe it is not. But even if it is the word of God, it was only meant for those people and for that time. Today, we have to follow the last and final message that's the last and final testament, the glorious Quran. But in spite of this, 
as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 79. فَوَيْلُ لِلَّذِينَ يَخْتُبُونَ الْكِتَابَ بِعَيْدِهِمْ سُمَّا يَقُلُونَ هَذَا مِنْ إِنْدِ اللَّهِ لِيَشْتَرُوا بِهِ ثَمَنًا كَلِيلًا فَوَيْلُ لُمْ مِمَّا قَتَبَتْ عَيْدِهِمْ وَيْلُ لُمْ مِمَّا يَكْسِبُونَ Woe to those who write the book with their own hands and then say, this is from Allah, to traffic with it for a miserable price. Woe to those for what they write, woe to those for what they earn. All the revelation that came before, the glorious Quran, the last and final revelation, all of them have not been maintained in the pure form. Allah says, people have changed the scripture. They have not been maintained. The only revelation, because since it was meant for a particular time period, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't think it fit to preserve it. But Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Hijar, chapter number 15, verse number 9, we have revealed the Quran and we shall guide from corruption. But in spite of this, in spite of this, even though they have been changed, Alhamdulillah, praise be to Almighty God, that yet, in this corrupted form, yet you will find the prophecy of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in it. The prophecy of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And you can refer to my video cassette, which mentions these prophecies. He has been prophesied in the Puranas. He has mentioned the Bhavishya Purana, Khanda 3, Adhyata 3, Shlokas 5 to 8. He also prophesied in Bhavishya Purana, Parva 3, Khanda 3, Adhyata 3, Shlokas 10 to 27. He has prophesied in the Psalm Ved, Book number two, chapter number six, verse number eight. He is prophesied in the Kuntap Suktas. That is the Tharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 127, verse number one to 13. He has been prophesied in the Tharva Ved, book number 20, chapter number 20, verse number six. There are several prophecies about him in the Hindu scriptures. He is also prophesied in the six scriptures. He is also prophesied in the Parsi scriptures. You can refer to my video cassette, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the various world scriptures. So if you have to be a good Hindu, you have to follow Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. If you have to be a good Parsi, you have to follow Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. If you have to be a good Buddhist, you have to follow Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Not only is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, prophesies, even the mention that you should worship only one God is mentioned in the scriptures. If you read, Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 7, verse number 20, it says, all those whose desires, all those whose intelligence has been stolen by material desires, they worship demigods. So Bhagavad Gita says, all the materialistic people, they do idol worship. Amongst the Hindu scriptures, the others are the Upanishads. It's mentioned in the Chandogya Upanishad, chapter number 6, section number 2, verse number 1. Ekam Evidityam. It's a Sanskrit quotation which means God is only one without a second. It's mentioned in the Sveta Sitar Upanishad, chapter number 6, verse number 9. Nakasya Kasij, Janita Nakadipa. Again, it's a Sanskrit quotation which means Almighty God has got no Lord, He has got no parents. It's mentioned in the Sveta Sitar Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 19. Na Patima Asti. Of Him, there is no likeness. Among the Hindu scriptures, the most sacred are the Vedas. It's mentioned in the Ayurved, chapter number 32, verse number 3, Na Tasya Patima Asti, of him there is no images. It's mentioned in the Ayurved, chapter number 40, verse number 8, that Almighty God is bodiless and pure. It's mentioned in the Ayurved, chapter number 40, verse number 9, Andhatma Pavishanti Ya Asambhuti Mupaste. They are entering darkness, those who worship the Asambhuti, the natural things like fire, water, air, etc. And the verse continues, they are entering more in darkness, those who worship the Asambhuti, that the created things like table, chair, idols, etc. Who says that? Yajurved, chapter number 40, verse number 9. And you can go on and on quoting, it's mentioned in Rigved, the most sacred amongst the Vedas. Book number 8, hymn number 1, verse number 1, March in the Sansad, all praises are due to him alone. It's mentioned in Rigved, book number 6, chapter number 45, verse number 16, Ya Ekit Mushtihi, there is only one God, worship him alone. And the Brahma Sutra of Hinduism is, Ekam Brahm Dustya Naste, Niya Naste Kinchan, Bhagwan Eki hai, Dusra Nahi hai, Nahi hai, Nahi hai, Zara bhi Nahi hai, there is only one God, not a second one, not at all, not at all, not in the least bit. So again, even while speaking to the other non-Muslims, whether it be Hindu, whether it be Parsi, whether it be Buddhist, I use the same verse which I started my talk with. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah, na'buda illallah, that we worship none but Allah. This is the master key according to me in the Quran for doing da'wah with any non-Muslim. Let him belong to any faith. Let him not have a faith also. The best is, 
Allah na buda illa Allah. Based on the criteria, Taala yula kalmi tum sawa im bani na bani kum. Come to common terms as been assigned you. Hope that answers the question. Jazakallah khair. Due to with deference to the brothers and sisters standing, we won't really take many written questions. Um, inshallah, we've got one, and we'll probably leave that t till the end. Uh, could the sisters ask a question? <clears throat> it isn't actually um, a question, and I'm not going to give any Bible quotes because you probably know the Bible better than me. And any Bible quotes I give, um, you'll find an apt response. But as a Christian, as a Christian for four years, I feel that I couldn't leave without saying something to the Muslim brothers and sisters here. I've listened to the speaker and um, a lot of what he said makes sense um, about how to serve God. A lot of it is in Christianity and in Judaism. But there's one thing I can't understand. You've talked about Jesus but you haven't actually pinpointed the, 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 the reason why he um, well, we as Christians, we believe he was sent from God, and you haven't actually explained um, the reason behind Christianity. And from what I've heard, the Muslim sisters and brothers can have a very um, biased, can I say, a biased view about Christianity. We believe that Jesus was indeed the Son of God, and he was sent to take our sins away to purge the sins of the world and without him we cannot see God if we do not confess that he is the son of God and that we are sinners and that we actually do need him in our lives even just to see God. Just, yeah, thanks Thank a lot for the question. Thank can you, I, you very much, Can I just make a, a short comment before the speaker that if you want to, um, rather than rather than just probably just coming to the question and answer session, if you want to, you could, you're free to interact with um, Muslim sisters, or, or, or if you've got any other burning questions you'd like to explore the matter a bit more, then as I mentioned before, um, you can after the talk we'd be willing to discuss. Thanks. Thanks for that. a good question. She says that. I haven't spoken much about Christianity with Jesus Christ peace be upon him preached and she said that she believes that Jesus Christ peace be upon him came to purge away the sins and remove the sin that was basic two questions and she believes that Jesus is the son of God sister regarding Jesus Christ being the son of God I've already told earlier that we very believe son of God if it means a righteous person we very well believe that you are the righteous person as it's mentioned in the book of Romans that as many are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God, and most verily Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was led by the Spirit of God, and he is the Son of God in that context, but not the begotten Son of God. Coming to your question, why didn't I speak much about the Christianity which Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, preached? Sister, the word Christianity doesn't exist anywhere in the Bible. I am a student of the Bible. The word Christianity doesn't exist anywhere in the Bible, and Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, did not preach Christianity. That's what I said, that many people have, I started my talk by saying, many people have a misconception that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was the founder of Christianity and he preached Christianity. Neither was he, neither was he the founder of Christianity, neither did he preach Christianity. That's what I said, because the word Christianity doesn't exist in the Bible. The only word that exists in the Bible, in the book of Acts, is that the disciples of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, they were given a nickname by the people of Antioch as Christians. But the word Christianity doesn't exist anywhere in the Bible. It was a nickname given by the people of Antioch to the disciples of Jesus Christ, peace be upon And later on, Christians. Therefore I said, if Christian means one who followed the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, then we Muslims are more Christian than the Christian themselves. And the full talk, sister, I gave, I gave the talk trying to prove that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said all these things, you should believe in one God, we believe in one God, that you should be modest. We are modest, we should not have alcohol, we should not have pork, that we should not have dead meat, we should not have blood. And all these things what I mentioned is talking about what Jesus Christ preached. He didn't preach Christianity, he preached submission to the will of Almighty God, which in Arabic we call as Islam. If you want to know in English, it is in English he preached a religion 
which says you should submit your will to Almighty God. As Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. For I seek not my will, but the will of my Father. Anyone who says, not my will, but the will of God, he is a Muslim. You said Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, came out to purge out your sins. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, I can of my own self do nothing. So how can he take out your sins? Yeah, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just. <laughs> For I seek not my will, but the will of my father. What he came, he came to guide the people that how not to sin and how to ask for forgiveness. That's what he preached. And regarding bearing the sin of others, this concept of original sin, which is preached by the church, though it's not present in the Bible, that all human beings are born in sin. It's based on the concept that Eve, may Allah be pleased with her, she tempted Adam, may Allah be pleased with him, to eat the forbidden fruit. That's the reason all human beings are born in sin. The question I ask, that did Adam, peace be upon him, ask me before eating the fruit? So why should I be born in sin? If I would have given permission to Adam, peace be upon him, eat the fruit, then if Allah holds me responsible, it sounds logical. Did Eve ask you before eating the fruit, may Allah be pleased with her? If she asked you and you gave permission, then fine, you can say that you made a mistake. Surely she didn't ask the sisters, neither did she ask the brothers. Neither did Prophet Adam, peace be upon him, ask us. So how can we be held responsible? And this concept that because of that, human beings are born in sin, and Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, came to remove the sin, and that you know that the only begotten son is kept as a slaughter, which doesn't sound logical at all. It doesn't sound logical at all. Imagine there is an employer who employs all his employees and they commit mistake, they rob, etc. So the employer tells the employee that now because you have robbed, because you cheat, because you don't do the job properly, I'm going to slaughter my son. And if you believe that I'm slaughtering him, then your sins are forgiven. It sounds illogical. No more questions. And regarding inheritance of sins, what does the Bible say? Bible says in the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 18, verse number 20, The soul that sins shall die. The father shall not bear the iniquity of the son, neither shall the son bear the iniquity of the father. The wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him, the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. But if the wicked turn and returns to the part, he shall not die. The Bible says, the soul that sin shall die, the father shall not bear the iniquity of the son, means the father shall not bear the sins of the sons, neither shall the son bear the sin of the father. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him, but if the wicked turns and repents, he shall not die. So if, sister, we do agree that human beings do make mistakes, we do commit sin, for that we have to repent. How to repent? by following the commandment of Almighty God. That's what Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said that you ask for forgiveness from Almighty God, will forgive you. That's what the Quran says, that you have to repent, you have to do tawbah. And if you repent in the right way, then inshallah Almighty God will forgive you. Nowhere did Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says that you believe me, that I am God, you believe that I died for your sin. This is a theory of St. Paul which is mentioned in Corinthians of St. Paul and that also if you analyze that if you see my video cassette was Christ crucified we can prove even from the Bible that Jesus Christ peace be upon him was not crucified so even if you agree with St. Paul's theory that Jesus Christ peace be upon him came to take away the sins that theory itself has got no basis because Jesus Christ peace be upon him even according to the Bible he was not crucified for more details, you can refer to my video cassette, A Debate with High, which I had with an Arab pastor. Arab pastor. Was Christ crucified? Hope that answers the question. Yeah, can we have a question from the brother's side? If, this, if the sister wants to respond, she's free to respond um, when the sister's turn comes about. Um, we aren't here to um, make sure people um, don't have an opportunity to express their views. Can the brothers ask the question? Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Naik. I have a simple but technical question. Um, Islam is about worshipping Allah. Does Allah mean the God, as in a composition of the two words al ilah The brother has a question that does Allah mean the God as composition of al ilah 
the moment i told in my talk if it the god then they can be the god the goddess also it can be it can be the god father also it can be the god mother also therefore allah is not the god allah is allah who is allah kul huwa allah ahad allah samad lam yulad wa lam yurad wa lam yakul lahu kuffan if you want to define allah the best way he is one and only absolute eternal begets not nor is he begotten and there nothing like him this is allah god is not the correct word but because when you speak with non muslim like the way i am doing when i speak with non muslim and i use the word god just so that they don't misunderstand that allah may be some deity etc for that purpose fine but god is not the appropriate translation for allah and neither it is the allah hope that answers the question thank you can we have a question from the sister side is any assalam alaikum you have not mentioned the gospel of barnabas is there a reason for that um is that gospel not accepted as an authentic gospel thanks for this last the question that i have not mentioned about the gospel of barnabas why is it that it's not authentic sister allah says in the quran in surah baqara chapter number 2 verse number 111 it says that all those who say they boast that you shall never enter jannah unless you be a jor christian wa qalu la yadkhulul jannata illa man kana hudan wa nasara they say the jews and christian that you muslims you shall never enter jannah unless you be a jor christian allah says tilka amanijuhum this is the wishful thinking bakwas e bakwas when desires kul tell them ha to bunanakum produce your proof in kuntum sadiqin but if you are truthful allah says when anyone makes tall claims that you shall not enter jannah tell them kul ha to bunanakum produce your proof in kuntum sadiqin but if you are truthful now the christians they have produced their proof as the bible you have to ask them for their proof you cannot say this is your proof let them produce the proof and the christian as a whole they do not consider gospel of barnabas to be authentic though i do agree gospel of barnabas is more closer to the islamic view point as compared to the other gospel of matthew mark luke and john but since they don't consider it to be authentic and when we can prove our point that there is only one god from these four gospels when we can approve our point that jesus is not god peace be upon him from these four gospels when we can prove our point that jesus christ peace be upon him was not crucified from the present bible so why should we go after gospel of barnabas if you want to read gospel of barnabas for academic purposes alhamdulillah but i never use it as an argument to the christian because first i'll have to have a debate with them that gospel of barnabas is true at the end of 5 years they may not agree at the end of 5 hours the christian may not agree so why should i waste my time when i can prove my point the islamic view point from the present bible which they are holding which they say is the word of god the present four gospels which they believe in so why should i go for gospel of barnabas reading for academic purposes it is good but while doing dawa i feel you should keep the gospel of barnabas out because the christian don't consider that to be authentic or to be the word of god hope that answers the question we've only got time for about two more questions so um If the questioners feel their questions are important to the topic. Okay. Okay, go on. Okay, my question is regarding the mission of the prophets. To me it seems that the prophets came with a mission with, which had a political nature. They came for a state, a power. As Allah said to Moses, "Izhab ila Fir'auna innahu tagha." Go to Pharaoh. Allah did not say go to Bani Israil. because pharaoh was in charge of a state uh, a government so isn't islam the mission of the prophets uh, have a political nature and from the very onset of islam when the prophet <coughs> went on the mount he said i'll give you this kalima with which the arab and the ajam world will be at your feet so he was indicating towards a mission towards a political nature uh, this mission of the prophet had which uh, seemed that was not covered by your talk was well, suppose the question that he feel that the three prophets that came they had more of a political nature which i didn't cover in my talk and he said that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told musa alaihi salam go to the pharaoh he didn't say go to bani israel brother quoting half the words the complete verse says go to pharaoh for what to believe in one god that to believe the bani that to free the bani israel did moses said make me king did he make me king of egypt he went to the king to free the jews to free the bani israel He didn't go to Pharaoh to say, "Okay, let's have a fight," and now I want to be the political leader. He never said that. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Which political leader he wanted to become? Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He was offered by the pagan Arabs, by the kuffars, 
If you know, it's mentioned in the hadith that Udba, one of the representatives of the pagan Arabs, they said that, Oh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you give up a mission, we will make you the wealthiest man in the full country. We will make you the leader of a community. We will crown you king. And the Prophet didn't agree. They went even through his uncle that give up, don't divide the people, don't say there's only one God. If you give up this mission, we will make you king. And the Prophet said, told his uncle Abu Talib that even if they place the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left I will not give up the mission until I die so where is the political nature yes politics is there in Islam but these people were sent to spread the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and when the message is spread how to lead a life and how to set up a country and a state is also mentioned but the main thing was calling towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and when you become a majority and when you have a particular state how to lay down the rules and regulations of Allah says but Moses peace be upon him was not sent to the Pharaoh to become the king of Egypt he was sent to free the people who were in bondage so that later on when they become free they can follow a life as laid down by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Islam does include politics but that doesn't mean it came to conquer the politics and become the king etc hope that answers the question can you have a question from the sister's side Assalamu alaikum. Um, the question is, what was the purpose of the prophets before Muhammad, peace be upon him, if they did not give the full teachings of Islam? And also, why did Islam come to Prophet Muhammad uh, instead of and not Prophet Moses or Prophet Jesus? This is the question that what was the purpose of all the prophets that came before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam if they didn't preach Islam? And why did Islam come to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and why not to Prophet Moses, peace be upon him? Sister, the reply is, as I mentioned in my talk, all the prophets preached nothing but Islam. Even Adam preached Islam, peace be upon him. Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Ishaq, Ismail, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all. All of them preached nothing but Islam. Islam by definition means submitting our will to Almighty God. What your question can be rephrased is, sister, that why wasn't the last and final revelation in the Quran given to Moses, peace? That can be asked. All the Prophet preached Islam, but Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the last and final messenger. Because he was the last and final messenger, to him was revealed the last and final revelation. The question can be rephrased and can be asked that why didn't the last and final revelation came to Prophet Moses, peace be upon him? Why didn't the first messenger, Adam, peace be upon him, only got the Quran and the matter is over? Sister, as I mentioned, all the prophets taught nothing but Islam. Islam means submitting a will to Almighty God Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The reason is, for example, you know, when I was a kid, I wanted to become a doctor. I'm asking my mother, I'm asking my father, Father, why didn't you put me in a medical college directly? Why did you put me in nursery and first standard, second standard, third standard, and then schooling and then college? Why didn't you put me in a medical college directly? There's a requirement that if you want to pass a medical college, first you have to do your kindergarten, and then you have to do your schooling, and then come to the college, and then get the grades. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself knows that when is the best time a human being can receive the message I feel Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most wise he knew that if this message came earlier the human being may not be in a capacity to assimilate it to digest it I feel Allah in his divine wisdom he is the author of the Quran he is the creator of us he knows best when human being can receive it and Allah thought it fit 1400 years back this is the time when human beings can receive it and that is the time he gave the last and final message that is the glorious Quran Hope that answers the question. Alhamdulillah, we've got some barakah in our time. So. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I wanted to ask a first question which the sister already asked about the Gospel of Barnabas. I wanted to ask why it's not mentioned in the Bible, but I'll leave that to your side. My second question is regarding crucifixion, which you mentioned uh, very briefly in your could talk. Could the brother please uh, raise his voice, inshallah? Or, okay. or could the brothers yeah. with the volume raise the mic? Yes. It mentions in the Quran, وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا سَلَبُوهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ Which means that they did not kill them, nor did they crucify him. But it was, it was uh, made unto them. I want to ask, what does the Quran mean by but what it was made unto them? Jazakallah khair. <coughs> what the brothers quoted the verse of the Quran from Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse 157, which says that they said in boast, we killed Jesus, son of Mary. They killed him not, neither did they crucify him. It was only made to appear so. And all those who differ is full of doubts. With only conjecture to follow. 
yakina for a shirt they killed him not. So they're asking the question that if Jesus Christ peace bear was not killed, wasn't killed, what happened to him? What happened to him? And the Quran says he because the Christians, most of them they believe that Jesus Christ peace be upon him was crucified. So you know, Allah clarifies that he was not killed, he was not crucified. It was made to appear so. Made to appear so means it was made to appear so. How it happened? When Allah does not want to give us the details, why should we actually strive to know the details? And Allah says that it was made to appear so. And all those who differ, there are many hypotheses that come that there was a man who was put instead of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, maybe it was Judas or maybe it was a Roman soldier. There are many hypotheses. But when Allah says, he was not killed, he was not crucified, he was made to appear so. All those who differ are full of doubts. Illa tiba zan, with only conjectures to follow. So when, what difference does it make? Even if you come to know what happened, what difference does it make in a faith? So when Allah does not want to reveal, Allah says he was not killed, he was not crucified, that's sufficient for us. If you want to prove to a Christian how he was not crucified, why he was not crucified, and how to prove from the Bible, you can refer to my video cassette, was Christ uh, really crucified? It's a debate. But regarding what happened, for us Muslims it's sufficient, Allah says he was not called, he was not crucified, it's sufficient. What happened to him after that is mentioned. As Allah says in the Quran, the next verse, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 158, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised him up alive. So we know that he was raised him up alive. That Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was raised up alive. And we believe he is going to come again in the second coming, which is also mentioned in the Gospel of John. That he's going to come. He's going to come. Why? The reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept him alive is because he is the only prophet of God whose followers as a whole mistook that he claimed divinity. There is no other prophet of God whose followers considered that that prophet claimed divinity. He's the only one. That's the reason he has been raised up alive so that in his second coming he can clarify. As it's mentioned in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 116. He will tell in the second coming, Ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you bear witness. I never told them to worship me, but I said, Abdullah, worship Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbakum, who is my Lord and your Lord. Similarly, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John. On that day, when people will come and say, O oh Lord, O oh Master, did we not do wonders and miracles in your name? So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, tells them, Ye men of iniquity, ye sinful people, you get out from here, I don't even know you. When Christians will come in the second coming, O oh Lord, O oh Master, did we not do wonders and miracles in your name? Bible says, Gospel of John, he will say, Ye sinful people, you get out from here, I don't even know you. He will come in the second coming, not to teach us anything new, our religion, Islam, is complete. As Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 3, this thing is complete. Nothing you can be added, nothing can be subtracted. He will come to testify to the Christians that he never claimed divinity. Hope that answers the question. Can we have the next question, please, from the sister side? And the question is, why do some Christians believe Jesus is God and others believe that he was the Son of God? Thank you. Sister, I have a question that why do some Christians believe he is God and some Christians believe that he is son of God? It is one and the same according to them. Because the son of God, like a son of man will be man, a son of goat will be goat, a son of lion will be lion. Similarly, son of God will be God. That is the concept. So if they say son of God or they say God, son of God meaning begotten son of God. Not the son of God as mentioned in the Bible like a righteous person. That way, if you are righteous, you become a children of God. If I am righteous, I become son of God, no problem. But what they mean, begotten son of God. Begotten son of God, if the son of begotten son of God, God's son will also be God. And that's context. That's the reason, if they say son of God, it's the same for them. Or if they say God, it's the same for them. Hope that answers the question. But I have proved to you in my lecture, he never claimed divinity. He never said that he was God. If any Christian can show me any unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says that I am God or worship me, I am ready to accept Christianity immediately today. Does anyone want to take up that challenge? <laughs> okay, inshallah, brother. Okay, assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I came from America, and your brothers and sisters in America, especially in Oklahoma, convey their salam and students of Peace Academy also in Oklahoma convey their salam. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless you, uh, increase you in knowledge, and grant you ikhlas or sincerity. My request or question is if you could shed some light on the notion of Trinity and how it can be refuted logically as well as biblically. Jazakallah khairan. You were asked the question that can I throw some more light 
on Trinity, how can logically prove it is wrong and biblically prove it is wrong? Whether the word Trinity does not exist anywhere in the Bible. You read the full Bible, the word Trinity is nowhere to be found in the Bible, but it is found in the Quran. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 171, Wala salasa. Don't say Trinity. In khairullakum. This is stop, it is better for you. For your God and our God is one Lord. <coughs> Allah repeats the message in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 73. لَقَدْ كَفْرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهُ سَالِسُ سَلَاسَ They are doing kufr, they are blaspheming those who say that God is three in one, those who say Trinity. So the word Trinity is nowhere to be found in the Bible, but it is in the Quran. Quran says, do not say Trinity. Now the Christian missionaries, when they believe in this concept of Trinity, the closest was they can quote of the Bible, which comes closest, not exactly, but closest to the concept of affinity is the first epistle of John, chapter number 5, verse number 7, which says, For God so loved the world, that, the uh, first epistle of John, chapter number 5, verse number 3, which says, that for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. The closest verse in the Bible, which can come close to the Trinity, is the first epistle of John, chapter number 5, verse number 7, which says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And if you read the Revised Standard Version, revised by 32 scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 different copy denominations, they say that this verse, first epistle of John, chapter number 5, verse number 7, is a concoction. It's a fabrication. It's an interpolation. And they've thrown this word out of the Bible. The only verse in the Bible which can come closest to the Trinity, the Christian scholars have thrown out of the Bible. So the whole concept of Trinity is not there at all. Because when Jesus Christ, peace be upon us, asked that which is the first of the commandment, he replied in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 12, verse number 29, he said, Shama Israelo, Adnai Haino Adnai Khad, Yero Israel, the Lord, our God is one Lord. He never said Trinity. He said there is only one God. This is a catechism of the church, of the Roman Catholic Church, which says that the Father is a person, the Son is a person, and the Holy Spirit is a person, but they aren't three persons, they are one person. This is the catechism of the Roman Catholic Church. The Father is a person, the Son is a person, and the Holy Spirit is a person. They aren't three persons, they are one person. I asked them, what person, 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 but not three person, one person? This doesn't sound like English. Suppose there are three triplets and if one of them commits murder, can you hang the other? They say no. I asked them why. They said because each one has a different personality. I said yes. And when we ask the Christians, the Christians when they talk about Father in Heaven, they have a mental concept, something like Santa Claus sitting in heaven with the earth as a footstool. When they think about the Son or the Word, they are thinking of Jesus Christ, peace be upon Him. Somewhat like Jeffrey Hunter in the movie King of Kings, you know, blonde eyes, good nose, no, blonde hair, blue eyes, Jeffrey Hunter, King of Kings. And when they are thinking about the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, it's somewhat like the fire that came in Pentecost or the dove when Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was being baptized. That's three different mental pictures. But when we ask them that when you talk about Trinity, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, how many pictures do you have in mind? They will tell you one. Believe me, they are lying to you. The three different mental pictures, how much you try to superimpose, you can never superimpose. Because one plus one plus one is equal to three, it's not equal to one. Hope that answers the question. Okay. Depending on the time taken, this would probably be the last question. So, um, inshallah, could the sister proceed? Assalamu alaikum. The Christians believe in one God, the Jews believe in one God, the Muslims believe in one God. Somebody said to me that, there's a few ways to get to the mountain. Why should he follow the Islamic path to submit to that only one God? Thank you. Sister has the question that the Jews believe in one God, the Christians believe in one God, the Muslims believe in one God. All lead to God. So why follow only Islam? That was, sister, the basis of the talk was that Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them, three men, one mission. All what we talk about Judaism, Christianity, what Moses, peace be upon him, taught was nothing but Islam. What Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, taught was nothing but Islam. What Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught was nothing but Islam. So, if you say, I'm going to follow Judaism. If you follow Judaism, you have to believe in what Moses, peace be upon him, said. Moses said that there's a prophet to come, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and you have to follow him. 
If you want to follow Christianity, you have to follow Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. He said in Gospel of John chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14, I have many things to say unto you, but he cannot bear them now. For he, when the spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you into all truth. So if you have to be a good Jew, you actually finally have to be a good Muslim. If you have to be a good Christian, you finally have to be a good Muslim. All these, if you have to follow Muhammad you have to be a good Muslim. All these prophets of God that came, right from starting, up to Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, from Adam peace be upon him, Muhammad all of them taught the same message and the other superficial thing may have changed here and there a little bit but the basic message of Tawhid, oneness of God was said and if you follow them you come to know they said that about the finer details more will be told to you later on all the prophets said that and all of them indicated that a final message Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa will be coming a final messenger and he'll be getting the final message that's the glorious Quran that's the reason the only way, as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 19, in the dina in the Allah islam the only religion, the only way of life acceptable in the sight of Allah is Islam. That is submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 85, that if anyone desires any other religion other than Islam, it will never be accepted of him. And in the akhirah, he will be among the losers. So the religion taught by all the prophets of God was nothing but Islam that's the reason the only religion that the true religion is religion of Islam that is submitting a will to Almighty God hope that answers the question okay we can take one more question um, are the brothers if they want to decide amongst themselves as to whose question is more important or um, we've got a question here which uh, said since all three men came with the same mission from the same one God does it matter which one messenger is followed? I think that might have been answered in, in the last answer you gave. So, inshallah, could uh, Don't take up the time deciding. Assalamu <laughs> <laughs> okay. alaikum. Um, you mentioned a hadith earlier on about, um, which is mentioned in Sahih Abu Dawud, and you said that, I can't remember the name of the Sahabi, but you said that I, he said, I saw my father praying without his shoes and with his shoes on. In the commentary of this hadith, it mentions that Rasulullah and the Sahaba, the only time they prayed with their shoes on was at the time of jihad, no other time. Can you expand on this? Did you mean that we can pray with our shoes on at any time? Or did you mean that we pray with our shoes on at the time of jihad? I suppose the question that I said in my talk, and you quoted the hadith, the reference I'll give you is Sunnah Abu Dawud, point number one. Chapter number 240 in the book of Salah, Hadith number 653, it was Shoaib ibn Umar who said, his father said that his father, he heard his father saying that the Prophet prayed. What you said that the Sahaba said his father prayed. If the, it's not his father prayed. His father said that his father saw the Prophet praying with his shoes on as well as barefooted. Regarding you saying that he, the Prophet only prayed during jihad. That's totally wrong. There are several hadith. That's not the only hadith. If you go to a hadith before that, in Sunnah Abu Dawud, volume number one, in the book of Salah, chapter number 240, hadith number 652, the Prophet said, do the opposite of what the Jews do. They pray, removing their foot away. That means a commandment. So therefore, the scholar says, at least once in your lifetime, you should pray with your shoes on. But today, because the mosque in a different situation as compared to that time, previously the mosques were made of, the ground was dirty and mud, that's why. Therefore now when we go to the mosque, we take out our footwear. But yet if you go to the haram, yet you'll find some people who wear clean shoes, the soles are clean, yet they go inside with shoes on. So even you can pray with shoes on any time, but see to it, as the Prophet said, that clean your souls. You can even pray here, you don't have to pray only in jihad. That's a misconception. You can pray with your shoes on, but it, the soul should be clean. But as a general rule, because you go in a mosque, and the mosque nowadays as compared to the time of the Prophet, now it's different, it has marble, it has clean flooring. That is the reason we most of the time when we go in the mosque, we take off our shoes. But if someone goes into the mosque, even with the shoes on, I'm sure most of the Muslims will catch him and even hammer him. <laughs> but the Prophet also went, you can go with your shoes on. But see to it is clean, but as a general rule, I advise you not to go, not that you can go, 
but because now it is a different thing, it's clean, etc. And how much you clean your soul, it may not be clean. But if you want, you can go. The Prophet has given permission. It is not only during jihad. Hope that answers the question. Wa akhir dawan alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. Jazakallah khair. والأصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلى الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر